children. It's so wonderful to have you uh, and to, we're so grateful that you took the time to speak with us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. May I introduce you? Sure. All right. So a native of the US, Venerable Children is a particularly qualified, is particularly qualified to teach Western monastics. She trained in Asia for many years, receiving novice ordination from Kabje Ling Rinpoche in 1977 and full ordination in Taiwan in 1986. Her teachers include His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Tenzin Hab Serkong Rinpoche, I'm so sorry, I'm sure I'm getting these names wrong, <laughs> um, Lama Zopo, Zopo Rinpoche and Lama Tupton Yeshe and many others. Uh, Venerable Tupton children, which ones did I just get wrong and can you pronounce uh, them correctly? Sen Senchab Serkong Rinpoche. Okay, thank you. In addition to founding Shravasti Abbey, Venerable Children is well known is a well known author and teacher. She has published many books in Buddhist philosophy and meditation, including four volumes so far in the Library of Wisdom and Compassion. Six volumes so far. I think most people aren't so hard at work, Venerable Children. So, <laughs> <laughs> co-authored with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, with whom she has studied for nearly forty years. Venerable Children teaches worldwide and is known for her practical and humorous explanations of how to apply Buddhist teachings in daily life. Venerable Children is also actively involved in prison outreach and interfaith dialogues. And just to add uh, my own bit at the end of this, uh, I grew up in Spokane and Servasti Abbey and Venerable Children were my um, one of my biggest Dharma gateways and the exploring monastic life retreat there at Servasti Abbey was what ushered me into robes. So I have a special place in my heart for Servasti. Yeah. Thank you. And it's reciprocal too. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think Ajahn Kovilo was going to lead in with some questions if that's all right. Mm -hmm. And uh, just, yeah. Yeah, thank you so much for, for being here with us. Um, maybe seven years or or so ago, I came across uh, some of your videos on how to bow. You gave a, an introduction on how to do full length Tibetan prostrations and uh, such, such useful videos. And um, that kind of leads into this whole topic of preliminary practices that exists in the, in the Tibetan tradition, the Ngondro, I'm probably mispronouncing mm -hmm. that, but um, this is something which doesn't necessarily exist so explicitly in the Theravada tradition. And I'd be curious if you, uh, I think I have listened to some of your talks uh, specifically about Ngontro, the different parts of it. Maybe there are five or six different um, aspects. If you could speak a little bit about what these preliminary practices are and what they are preliminary to. Uh, okay. So what are they and what are they preliminary to? Yeah. There's actually, when we talk about Ngontro or preliminary practices, there's one, um, according to Sutrayana, which is often called uh, parting from the four clingings. That's, that's one version of it. Um, this particular one that you're talking about is the, uh, the preliminaries before doing a tantric retreat. Okay. Um, actually, I should say a highest class tantra retreat. So... Uh, there's one version that has five parts, another version that has nine parts. And the whole purpose of them is to uh, purify the mind and accumulate merit. The idea being that in order to really understand the teachings and in order for your meditation to give you some experience of the teachings, we have to clean, cleanse our mind and quote, quote, fertilize it first. Okay. So the analogy is often given that the mind is like uh, a field. And so purification is like taking out all the rocks and stones and bubble gum wrappers and pollution that the company down the road put into it. Okay. You need to purify and take the rubbish out of the field and then um, fertilize it, you, you know, add fertilizer, water. And so that's the part about creating merit. So uh, I think practices like this, I mean, bowing, making offerings, uh, all these kind of practices, confessing uh, our mistakes and so on. It's found in the Theravada practice. 
it's not just it's just not systematized in the way that it is in the Tibetan practice. The reason for a hundred thousand, which is actually a hundred thousand one hundred and eleven thousand one hundred and eleven, because you add ten percent to cover up for all the ones that you didn't do so well. Um, but the reason for any number at all, actually, as one Lama put it, is to be able to do one with complete uh, attention and, and focus with the right kind of attitude. Yeah. And so we all know, you know, we do practices and our mind spaces out and our mode, sometimes our motivation's not so good. And so the, the reason for doing so many is to give us a chance to really, uh, yeah, do at least one, hopefully, in the way it should be done. But uh, yeah, it also, it, it really does affect the mind doing those. I, I know for myself, uh, just doing, there's, there's one of them, um, that's focused particularly on purification called Vajrasattva. And I know after I did that one, um, when I went back and listened to teachings from my teacher, it was like, oh, is that what he's been saying? All of a sudden, the teachings went into my mind in a very different way than they had before. Yeah. So definitely affects the mind in a positive way. Hmm. Yeah, that's really good perspective. As, as I remember it, um, yeah, I was in my mid, mid 20s when I came across these uh, preliminary practices. You've got 100,000 full length prostrations, 100,000 like <laughs> offerings of bowls, 100,000 mantras. And it's, uh, there's something which like feels so macho about, about these, <laughs> these practices. And, uh, and, and, and that's curious, like, it seems like there's a place for, for being macho for this like heroic energy in the practice. But at the same time, I mean, another um, Tibetan practice, which seems to be much more, much less about counting is, you know, counting your accomplishments and more about this exact moment is like uh, Dojin. And I'm curious if you could maybe speak about how to balance, you know, the, the, the part of the mind that wants to uh, quantify your practice in mm -hmm. terms of how many hours you've meditated or how many times you've bowed or how many times you've said a mantra versus the mind, which is just totally content and realizes uh, emptiness or realizes um, just a, a profound level of uh, seeing into impermanence and uh, not self in the present moment. Mm. I think those, those two things uh, arise at different times. You know, first we have to purify and, and create merit. Then the understandings of impermanence and, and emptiness have a chance to, be, uh, to arise in the mind. Yeah, but when the mind is not properly prepared, you can do hours of meditation. You can do long retreats on whatever topic you want, but you don't you won't necessarily have a, a big shift in the mind so there's this story Lama Tsongkhapa you know in our lineage and he was already a great teacher and Manjushri uh, he had some questions about emptiness he didn't feel like he really had the correct view and Manjushri told him to go off and do re, uh, purification and accumulation of merit retreat. So he took eight disciples. He went into um, the mountains in Tibet. I was able to go there in the place where, where he did these practices. And he made, he made three and a half million prostrations. He made many mandala offerings. And then his meditation really bore fruit. And he had... a uh, the correct realization of emptiness. Yeah. How, how do you as a teacher or you in your own practice, um, well, those are maybe two different questions, but um, how do you determine when you're ready to um, 
yeah, really approach, you know, a, uh, the meditation practice? Is it like, okay, you do your, you do all these preliminary practices and don't mm -hmm. meditate at all before you're finished with, you know, the last one, or do you start oh. from the beginning and these preliminary practices are meditation practices, many of them. Okay, so I mean, doing Vajrasattva, you're seated, seated on a cushion, you're meditating. When you do Guru Yoga, the same thing. Prostrations, your body's moving, mandala offering, it's your body's moving, but your mind, you know, should be uh, focused on what you're saying, what you do, you're doing, what the purpose of that practice is. Okay, so meditation isn't uh, necessarily single, you know, single pointed meditation in samadhi. Anyway, how many people really have that? Yeah. <laughs> Children, the the duality you're pointing to right now, and um, and just to say, I, I Ajahn Kovilo is a sort of there's a legend of him in a Bayagiri. He took this practice on and sort of was bowing in closets and stuff out of the way where he could get away, and so people would keep opening cleaning closets and find him there, <laughs> which is somehow a good metaphor. But um, I um, I'm wondering if uh this sort of overlay of, um, you know, the, the, the strange, almost dichotomy of the complete, you know, over, um, this abundance of action and um, uh, almost a, uh, you know, beautifully, almost uh, impossible thing to reach. Although one can do a hundred thousand prostrations, but oh, yeah, cer I've certainly it, it's, it's way up exactly. And, but it's, you know, but contrasted with this moment where one's practice returns to that still center. Um, for me, it, it overlays onto this question around the, the Bodhisattva path as a whole in that I've, you know, I know that, um, the bodhisattva vows, some of them seem quite impossible on the surface of them, you know, so if it's just Avilokiteshvar is to not become liberated until all beings have. And I wondered if I've heard some teachers say that those teachings are usually paired with one ones of emptiness, because there does come a point where even those bodhisattvas might uh, switch their practice into, you know, another mode and the vows might dissolve into something larger or different. Um, I don't know if that there's a parallel there or what you see is the relationship between those two kind of dichotomies okay. I see. Okay, can, before I answer your question, can we back up a little bit? Please, I'm sorry. Because, no, don't apologize. Because I wanted to, to re, uh, respond to Achan uh, Kovila's uh, thing of the, you know, the 100,000 this and that being very macho. Yeah, it is not macho. Yeah, what my observation is, if you try and be a heroic macho, enduring these things to get enlightenment as quick as you can, then your practice is quite ego involved. Yeah. I'm going to prove how renounced I am, that I can do this. And there, there's this element of tension and an element of pushing. I'm pushing myself because I want to, I've created this image of, you know, being, I'm going to be the next Achan Mun, you know, uh, or Milarepa or whoever it is. I'm going to be just like, and we've created an image and we're pushing ourselves to fulfill an image. And it's all very artificial because Dharma involves looking at what's going on right now in our mind and not creating an image of who we're not, which, you know, all of us in one way or another tend to do, especially at the beginning, because 
when we ordain, we want to be perfect. We're going to be the perfect monastic. Okay. So actually, if you have a macho attitude when you're when you're practicing, you're going to have a lot of obstacles, actually, I think. Yeah. And it and also it's not so hard. I mean, I've done I've done uh, eight of the nine preliminaries, a hundred thousand of each. And it's not that hard. You know, you just do them and you're, you know, uh, the mind, of course, at the beginning likes to count and look, look, look how many I have. you add them all up. And then at some point you realize that's just ego. That's not practice. You put that down and you try and just do the practice and be in the rhythm of it. When you're doing your preliminary practices, you're also doing other meditations. You know, even if you're uh, doing your preliminary practices as like a retreat, you know, most of your practice will be those, but then you'll also do other meditations. Yeah. And so, you know, this is now coming into what you've asked. Uh, yeah, uh, Achan, uh, are you an Achan now? Or are you a Tan? No, I'm still Tan Nisipo, not Ajahn. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, well, I can call you both venerable. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, either way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> anyway, it, it, this follow, it, this goes into um, into your qu question about seeing dichotomies and mm, His Holiness Dalai Lama has uh, he, he said it very clearly that. Our mind is a very is something that is very complex, and it has many different parts to it. And if you're aspiring for full Buddhahood, where your purpose is really to be able to benefit sentient beings, then you need to cultivate many, many, many different qualities. Yeah, just the realization of emptiness is not sufficient. That, that, that is a crucial realization because that is what gets you out of the 12 links and the rebirth in samsara. But to really be able to benefit other beings most effectively, there's so many different aspects of our mind that we need to develop, okay? So, we, so His Holiness says, therefore, there's many kinds of meditation, yeah? And when you see your practice, which I've learned to do over many years, um, to see your practice as something that occurs over time in this life and over time in many, many lifetimes. Yeah. And then to know that you have to develop different aspects of yourself focus on them in different lifetimes. You have to create different kinds of merit in different lifetimes. And so then, you know, somehow uh, your mind shifts and you become, you do all, you try and develop all the aspects of yourself while focusing on one or another, okay? And you realize that they all come together in terms of making, uh, creating the causes for Buddhahood, okay? So we often talk about the path as having a method side and a wisdom side. So the method side um, is the part of, is uh, having the aspiration to be free of samsara, generating bodhicitta, doing all the practices of the paramis or the paramitas, you know, uh, to, to really develop yourself as a generous person, an ethical person, a person with inner strength and fortitude, a person with effort, you know. So the first four of, of our six uh, paramitas are focused on the method side. And there, a lot of what you're doing is uh, there are certain practices, meditation practices to develop that, but you also engage in the world and with sentient beings, yeah? And you learn 
through doing and you learn through making mistakes <laughs> yeah <laughs> and then figuring out how to you know uh, how to remedy that so that's the method side the wisdom side is when you're really working on shamatha and vipassana and trying to uh, have the realizations of impermanence and emptiness and so on Okay, and so those two sides of the path, they're called like two wings of a bird. And to fly a bird needs both wings. One wing is not going to get you up in the air to where you want to go. Okay, and so we, in our daily practice, we try and include both. Although sometimes we may emphasize one or the other or in certain lifetimes, we may emphasize one or the other, but trying to, to do both, uh, you know, in some way on a daily basis. Okay, does that make some sense? Does that answer your question okay? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So is the, is the method side, could that be summarized as being like a path of skillful means of upaya? Is that what? Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah.